it feels a little redundant to introduce <laughs> this panel. I mean, like, who doesn't know who Michael Franti is? Hello. <laughs> Thank you. And we have Jay Ferris, of course, also, and Ford Smith. I'm just really blown away that I have the opportunity to uh, ask these people questions. So you'll have to indulge me because I'm going to ask them everything I've always wanted to know. So I hope it's the same things you do. And since they so, have so much to say, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Michael. Uh, I'm Mike, Michael Franti. I'm a musician, activist, filmmaker, uh, hotel owner. And uh, I have been uh, active speaking about cannabis for many decades. About um, and I'm just excited to see how it's bringing so many communities together in such a positive way now. My name is Jay Ferris. I have a company called The Wellness Agency. Uh, we help wellness companies scale through capital, marketing services, and entry to Asia. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I was so psyched when Catherine Innie invited me. I know her from a previous life when she managed bands that were on my record label. My name's Ford Smith. Uh, I'm an intermittent faster. Um, I, uh, I still have not eaten today. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I have a, a venture fund called Alternative. Um, I've got a, a lending platform called the Chrome Exchange. It's like a, a B2B kind of wholesale marketplace, but also uh, a fully integrated lending solution for the cannabis industry. Um, uh, I've been in for five years. Uh, first investment was uh, with Steve D'Angelo at Harborside, and uh, following that, got involved with a group called Ease, the d delivery app. Um, and then since then, I've been, you know, kind of focusing on early stage brands um, up and down, you know, the, the, the Golden Coast. Applause for so when, when Kat first approached me and asked me about moderating this panel, I was thinking, okay, this is an interesting one. I'm not, you know, I'm just like, I'm... I'm all science, I'm all about chemistry, I'm an engineer, I'd say like kind of leave the, the, totally on the left side of the brain, and then there's like this right, and then I looked, okay, but it's, it's all the same. One of the beautiful things about cannabis is it knows no age, gender, social, economic barriers. It is, has the opportunity to help everybody at everywhere that they exist, wherever they are at this point in their lives. And so I was really excited to have a chance to ask the questions. And the first one I want to ask is, where do we draw the line on what the definition of wellness is? Since we're talking about this as a trillion dollar industry, what does that actually mean? That's a thousand billion, as Jim uh, McAlpine pointed out before. That's a lot of money, a lot of money. If anyone wants to jump in on that one, take a shot at it. Um, I mean, this is a simplified thing, but we act the way we measure it in wellness, it's actually four trillion. Um, anytime you can take, so, our mission side is big food, big pharma, Western medicine have gone completely off the rails, how there aren't 100,000 doctors in jail for creating the opiate, opiate crisis, the oxy crisis. So I think anytime you can get people off pharma onto plant-based medicine, <coughs> anytime you can get people off of processed food onto plant-based food, um, uh, mass industrial cattle versus plant, you know, uh, beyond meat. So. Um, it's, it's core, you know, I look at, you've got to save the planet, then it's like save our democracy, then mainstream wellness for the benefit of humanity. And, and I think a lot of these um, solutions uh, take us back to the can of plant. Anybody have anything else to say on that? Sure. Uh, wellness for me isn't just about um, medicines that we take when we're sick. It's about a journey that all of us have to taking care of our bodies and our lives, but most importantly, the way that we feel every day when we wake up and go throughout our life. And cannabis uh, can aid to that in so many ways. I mean, across the, the whole spectrum from, um, uh, you know, reducing um, rainforest degradation all the way to where the way people feel when they wake up in the morning, uh, using creams, using internal based uh, cannabinoids, whatever it is. Wellness is part of that. Um, I'm 53 years old, and I've watched as my audience of, of fans has grown, you know, and it's like people come up to me and they go, hey, man, I met this girl at your show five years ago. Now we have a kid together, you know. <laughs> and um, it's super exciting for me to see that. And I've also seen how my audience of, of, of fans has, they're not millennials, you know, anymore or they weren't at, at, at all, actually. Uh, 
but but I would say they're a, a different word, which is that they're perennials. And what a perennial is, is someone who's always looking to the light. Like, how can I this year wake up and find something new that's exciting in my life, that invigorates me, that keeps me healthy, that makes me want to go forward into the future? And I want to consume things that do that, and I want to support brands that are bringing that to me. And mainly, at the end of the day, I want to feel like I'm not getting old every year, but that every year I'm coming back again like a, like a, like a perennial flower does. And that's what wellness is to me. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Good. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm from, from uh, West Texas, Midland, Texas, and, and you know, I, I live in Los Angeles now, and I realized, you know, every time I go back, just like what, what a bubble we actually live in. You know, there's, there's not a, a juice shop on every corner, you know, in, in cities across America. But one of the things that I, I kind of just realized yesterday in having a conversation with my friend, I just came from Texas this morning, was, you know, CBD is now showing up, you know, you're seeing it in CVS, Walgreens, and, and kind of, I guess, uh, coffee shops. And it's, whereas people, you know, people always, in my community, they looked at, you know, marijuana, cannabis as this, like, drug, and then all of a sudden, this whole, like, CBD craze comes out. And it was the first time that, you know, a lot of, I guess, people in my community started to, like, investigate even further about what cannabis could be or what the potential was. So I think that, like... I think that, you know, thank, thank God for, for, for THC, but honestly, like, the CBD wave has just totally, you know, I think, like, it's revolutionizing, like, our concept of what wellness is, you know, and I'm seeing it in, in small communities that, you know, formerly don't really put too much thought into, like, wellness, diet, you know, you know consciousness, well-being, and, and you're just starting to see, like, you're just getting a little taste of that. Every time I go back, I just keep getting more and more inspired that, like, you guys, like, there mo there, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the news right now, but, like, there's hope, you know, and I think that this plant is really like, it's a catalyst for, for positive change. And I think we're seeing it right now. So you, you, uh, that was like 10 questions from now, but you introduced it now. So I'm going right there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to go. No, 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 no. There's, it's, just, it's about where the conversation goes. It's not about where the list of questions is. So, um, let's talk about hemp for a minute and uh, hemp CBD, uh, versus CBD period and versus hemp and what it can do. So we're living in a planet where, uh, based upon the latest science, um, we're almost beyond the tipping point of being able to save it. Hemp has the capability because it can replace so many negative, uh, you know, fossil fuels, plastics, uh, on and on and on and on. And especially, you know, those of us in the cannabis industry, we have so much packaging requirements. It's, you know, obviously it's up to us to make sure that we're using uh, sustainable things. But I see all these giant industrial grows going on to extract CBD when it kind of breaks my heart a little bit because I'd like to see these big giant industrial grows going to make textiles and fuels and fibers and do some of these packaging, all these different things to save the planet and keep the CBD inside of a regulated market to where people know what's in it because it's had to be the lab tested rigorously. It's had to have the standards to it. So, you know, how do we balance the fact that there's this wave and yes, CBD has opened the door to so many people's eyes to the safety and the, and the possibilities with cannabis but how do we get them through a safe, regulated door and have hemp do what hemp can do best and that's save the planet? I, I love what you said. I, I think that, you know, uh, I think more capital needs to start being um, infused into these like earlier stage businesses that are, that are hypothesizing all the different uses for hemp. You know, I think that as we look at, there aren't a, a ton of investment opportunities out there like around the other uses of the biomass, you know, CBD is obviously the, the demand is is there and it's in front of us. And so, you know, as as investors, you know, people are looking on the sidelines, going, "Well, you know, I do." You know, if you have any vision, you can see in in five, ten years where this thing's headed. But right now, the demand is in CBD, and and you know, unfortunately, I was just reading an article this morning. Most some of y'all saw, but it was just it was really talking about how there's not a lot of like. Uh, there's a lot of farmers that are are out growing hemp right now this season, and they're harvesting now and the market's just kind of crashing because there's not a lot of places to process this. And so, you know, not just with CBD, but really in the biomass side, you know, 
we need to start looking at the types of, you know, I think we need to start accelerating growth around innovation. I mean, we know, we've got, we've got these theories that it's all, you know, that we can replace most anything that's sitting around us with this, you know, this material. I think that, that you know, these... But I, but I also think it's, you don't think it's happening. Like, look at the growth that's happening now in CBD versus where it was five years ago, or the THC side of the equation, and, and you're seeing this growth curve, and I think as those CBD markets are explored, as more science comes out about the benefits of the plant, people will start to see these other opportunities. That they, they may not be on the radar yet for the investor, but I think they will start to come on the radar in the next two to three years. I think it's a, a, all about how it feels. Like when, when somebody said, hey, man, let's like mix like chocolate and peanut butter or like a phone and a camera. And people were like, why would anybody want chocolate and peanut butter or like a phone with a camera and it doesn't make any sense? And then you feel it and you're like, fuck, that tastes fucking good. This fucking camera shit, I can send this to my friend. This is awesome, you know? And it's the same thing with hemp clothes. I'm like, hemp and a shirt. It sounds like the scratchiest thing you could ever want, you know? <laughs> and now, I, and the first hemp shirt I got was that. It was like this thing. It was like so stiff. It was like right. a piece of cardboard. And I put it on and I go, oh, this feels really great. I feel really good about it. But then now there's so, <laughs> right, they're so soft. Now there's so many hemp shirts um, that are soft and that feel incredible. And so it's really about... A, a, a just allowing people to experience, to touch, to feel. How do things feel when you experience it? And that's when it starts to reach critical mass, like the phone, like everybody's taking a picture. You know? right. <laughs> um, and that's it. Like at a certain point, it's going to reach that critical mass. And then telling the story of not only does it feel good when you wear it, but you feel good knowing that you're contributing to, you know, safe farming methods and methods that are helping to regenerate soil, which is bringing carbon out of the sky and putting it back into the earth, which is what we need to reduce, um, you know, the climate crisis that we're in right now. Absolutely. You know, I, th I think that um, when we talk about hemp and, and all the possibilities of it, and I look at other industries where we've had also had barriers to entry and people are like suspicious of it at first and then it becomes commonplace. I think of it, you could you probably compare that to the electric car. When they first came out, I was very interested in it, but you know, where I live, I mean, I would have had to stop and uh, plug in for eight hours to make it home from the office. So it's like, that's not really realistic. Well, I also, like, I go to Asia five to six times a year as we take companies in there um, and the shift in the last two years alone still if you smoke a joint they'll throw you in jail for five years in Korea still but the flip side of that CBD was illegal two years ago Korean government Hong Kong government Singapore Thailand uh, people close to the prime minister's family in Thailand are helping change uh, legislation Cambodia Laos Vietnam Chinese government um, there so the shift is fairly rapid what's going on I think on a global scale so we're supposed to be talking about how we're getting to a trillion dollars, which is a really big number. And I, and I, I know it's possible because, you know, I looked, I, I did a presentation a couple of times. I did one for actually for the government of Columbia, looking at all the different um, uh, job opportunities, touching the plant all the way through not touching the plant. And there's almost no career path that you can take where you can't add cannabis to the end of it and say, okay, I'm going to do it. Whether you're a teacher or, a, or a, a lawyer or a, you know, a chemist or a botanist, whatever it is, cannabis has a place for you. Um, do we include all those or how do we get the investor dollars to go to the things that aren't quite as sexy um, and also to invest in the things that have that might take us a few years to actually have the soft t-shirt but somebody has to fund these guys in the meantime so that they can do it you know we need hempcrete but somebody has to put the dollars into it and not worry about the quarterly report and the roi and the exit strategy they need to give people a chance to actually develop these under so who is that investor? Um, I guess you guys work with investors more, right? For, yeah. I mean, like, pipe dream for me was to, like, before I started this fund, it really was to build an incubator, and I wanted to focus on early-stage brands, and I wanted to focus on, you know, um, innovations with hemp. And uh, that I have, I've kind of been out in the market looking for something like that. I've seen a few business like models presented, pitch decks that say that, you know, within this vertically integrated hemp company, they're going to have, you know, a, a hemp incubator. Um, I haven't seen anybody do it really well yet, but I'm, I'm like, I'm 
that would be that'd be incredible. I mean, if anybody knows any differently, please see me after this. <laughs> but in in terms of the types of investors, I think the funds are going to be less inclined because they do want the quarterly report. They want a straight line, which never happens. Um, and I think it's often a high net worth or a family office who understands the vision, the power of the plant, believes in an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and is and is going to give you two to three to five years to sort of figure out what that becomes. That makes sense. So um, in the cannabis world, which we're all in here in one form or another, uh, because we touch the plant, we love the plant, we, you know, I, it's, it's my medicine. I use it every day. It keeps me alive. Um, big Pharma with a, you know, with capital B, capital P has a really, really bad rap, deservedly so. The pharmaceutical world with a small P, same way if you go Democratic Party, big D, small D democracy, not, it's a different story. Pharma, you know, thank God we have pharmaceuticals or we would not have the life expectancy. A lot of, I mean, not, quality of life isn't so great. So cannabis can be the big disruptor in pharma. And instead of looking at it as our enemy, look at it, how do we make cannabis part of the pharmacopoeia to where it, where it used to be, how do we get it back in there um, and get the kind of uh, um, um, respect that we deserve for this plant. Um, is there things that we could be doing um, messaging? Is there a thing we should be doing in the way that we're branding and packaging or the way that we go after markets? How do you feel that we can actually get this conversation moved over to pharma so that it's taken more seriously by the people who actually make the recommendation? Because we're all early adopters, even, even as big as it is right now. The, the people, you know, grandma and grandpa, and I'm one of those, um, who uses it, you know, you know they still are growing up on that reefer madness thing and don't see it, you know, how do we get their doctor to recommend this? Because that's where the real dollars start coming is when this becomes something that people are refilling every month like they would a prescription. Well, my mom, when I was a teenager, my mom had the talk with me. And it was like, if I ever, <laughs> that's how it started, you know. And uh, then a few weeks ago, I call my mom, and I'm like, she's 86 years old. I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? She's like, <laughs> I just bought some cannabis, and I'm <laughs> it's helping my hip, and it's helping my knees, and it's helping me feel better, you know. And she wasn't actually smoking a joint, but I just yeah. love that image of my mom, little gray-haired lady smoking a spliff. That was so cool. Uh, but she was, she was taking um, uh, CBD, and, um, and I'm like, I'm, I'm excited to see her the next time because I want to ask her, like, what was the story that got you from being, you know, mad mommy to now being, <laughs> now being a consumer, you know? And so my answer to that would be to listen to people and to talk to people, have conversations like, where are you at with this issue? And, and how far have you, what have you heard about it? And, and to people who are now, especially consumers who, were against it at first, like what got you to this place? What were the things that you heard along your story that helped you think like, hmm, this is something that's part of my life? And then when you experienced it, what was, this, what was the experience that you had that made you a believer and made you want to come back? And then also made you an evangelical to all your other blue-haired friends at the, at the house, uh, you know, you know, when you're playing bridge and instead of having the Jesus juice, you're passing over <laughs> the Holy Sage, you know. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, yeah, I think listening to people and asking people what their experience has been will help us to be able to understand our pathway to how to best tell the story to others. I, I think it's word of mouth coming up from the bottom uh, and maybe that's coming in from the coast, but you know, Kentucky's already such a gross state. I, I think I think there's a lot of people that are reevaluating it. And I think on pharma coming into it, there's good. You know, for, again, pharma's done a ton of great things, but it's also gone off the rails now. And and there will be great companies who try and come into that space and use it for the benefits that it has. And there will be, you know, the analogy I always give is. The label that was great for you for Spearhead is probably not the same label that breaks Mariah Carey or the back. It's, it's, I think you'll have good examples and bad examples. Um, so it's sort of a case by case basis on that side. I think fortunately for us, we're all you know. If, if you believe in the plant and you do want to see like 
this, you know, the plant not get tarnished over time. We all have, we're the foundation of this like industry. We've got, if you feel a certain way about something, I, I feel very uh, strongly about voicing, you know, your relationship to the plant, you know, in, in meetings and like, don't support businesses that if you get like a bad vibe that, you know, if it's something that just doesn't resonate with you and you're meeting with a brand or an investor or something like that, and, and you can just kind of see the, the green in their eyes and not in like the best way. I'm not saying don't do business with them. I'm just saying like, be a, be a, almost a catalyst for change in them. And just like you said, like share your story. You know, my, my business partners are a little more like brutal than I am, but like just the other day, you know, we were, we were with a banker and, and he's just like, dude, okay, do you smoke weed? And like, and, and the guy was just kind of totally taken back. And it was like, it was kind of a joke, but it kind of wasn't. It was like, that's, you know, I think it's, if you believe in it, like, let's set the record straight that like, this is a medicine. And, and like, if you're putting dollars to work, or you're putting, you know, your, your sweat equity to work, like make sure that you're, you know, hopefully doing it with the right people that support that, in there, that narrative. Um, I, I speak at a lot of uh, a lot of conferences. You guys might know that, um, and uh, but I've also started speaking at pharmaceutical conferences, and I spoke at one in Boston a couple weeks ago, and I sat through presentation after presentation after presentation on all these big pharma. I mean, there's so much going on in big pharma with cannabis. You have no idea, and they're doing it all wrong. Every one of them is looking at a single molecule, synthesizing it, looking for the mechanism of action, completely missing the point of this plant. And I got up there and I gave a big presentation on our breast cancer research on full spectrum compared to, and it was like real science, you know, I mean, PubMed stuff. My inbox is blowing up. <laughs> blowing up. Yeah. 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 They're like, I mean, yeah, it's like, you guys are going to do it again. You're going to take it. And, and all the things that are in this plant that keep us from overdosing, besides the fact that we have no receptors in our brain stem and all the science of it, but the plant itself has natural things in it that you'll get sick before you get, before you die. Same thing with the poppy and any other plants. I mean, they're designed in such a way by a nature that's much greater than us it's only when you take them out and synthesize or, or singular that you end up having overdoses because you'd be sick if you ate enough poppy. You'd be sick before you could overdose from it, and you'd, it, you'd puke it out. So it's important that we make sure that we move this over into pharma and kick them a little bit side to understand how to work with full spectrum. But it's not so bad that, like, I used to be under the impression, or I used to just have this idea that, like, oh, God, fuck pharma. Like, they're going to come eat this whole thing up. And somebody, like, stopped me, like, a year ago, and they were like, you know, as long as you're helping drive the narrative of what this thing is and what the potential is, like, they're just fuel for the fire, you know. If you, but you have to help kind of like steward that forward. If that makes sense. Yeah, I absolutely. You feel the same way, but I'm absolutely. Yeah, that's why I started Zelda Therapeutics. So we could do biopharma, full plant, full spectrum, tr clinical trials, teach people how to use the plant, but use it as a whole medicine instead of these silly single molecules. So where do we where do we have the roles of like social equity and gender and race and, and all the things that we can do with this to bring opportunities to people that maybe have not had it in the past or um, are coming out of, you know, MBA programs, curious and wanting to get into cannabis. I mean, what is our responsibility to those people now? Well, I live in Hunter's Point in San Francisco, and those of you who don't know the history of Hunter's Point, uh, and during World War II, a lot of African Americans were brought from the Deep South to work in the shipyards on ships. And the shipyards operated and the, and the Navy base operated until 1992 when the Clinton administration closed it. And there became a lot of unemployment in our community. Um, used to be a really, uh, really strong community. Homeowners were, the, every, everybody owned their own home. They, were, they, they, they had decent jobs. Uh, and um, and then at that same time in the late 80s and into the 90s, crack came into our neighborhood and it started to devastate our neighborhood. And so weed was an opportunity for people to not sell crack and, then, and to be able to earn a living on the street. Lots of, lots of jobless people there. But people were getting arrested for weed and being put in jails. And with the mandatory minimum sentencing that was going on in California, people started serving these extreme long sentences and it destroyed our community. It ravaged our community. And if you go out on the street and you talk to any any one of my neighbors who is, you know, 
maybe a 40 plus year old male and ask them, you know, what their life has been like. They're like, I've been in and out of jail. What did you get in trouble for? Drugs. I got popped for selling a little weed and it just became a cycle that I was in. And so now there's a lot of people who are, um, who are, you know, who are still in prison. I heard a number today of 40,000 people in America are still in prison for weed-related offenses. And we need to get them out. And not only do we need to get them out, but we need to find opportunities for them to succeed in this business that they created, basically. You know? um, or if they didn't create it, they were at least there as a big part of, of helping to, to spread the word about it. And um, so I'm excited to meet so many people here today who, who feel that sense of social responsibility. And I think that there's a big opportunity here today. It's, I, I'm here with so much optimism because I see that there's um, ways for um, the knowledge of those men and women who have served all this time to become part of this whole conversation and really help to advance it in a super positive way, just like you were mention, mentioning, to create jobs. Um, and, but mainly to just keep families intact that were once ripped apart by America's war on drugs. Yeah. Ford, you, have, uh, you have the work that you're doing through Ease. and Yeah, we, we launched uh, a little over four weeks ago. We launched a program we're calling Momentum with Ease where um, – if you're a social equity uh, owner or operator of a brand, you can come in, you can apply. We'll, we're giving out $50,000 grants, running you through a three-month accelerator course where we'll give you access to ease uh, distribution, legal, marketing, brand, advertising, supply chain help, everything. And um, it's been interesting for me just because, you know, as much as uh, where I come from, it's not, you know, I hate to say that, like, I, the bubble I live in, they don't understand. Like, it's hard to tell a story about how important, like, this social equity initiative is. Like, and, I, and it's, you know, it's an, in, in, in Texas, in the yeah. South in general. Um, and it's been really cool to sit with guys that would have never put much thought into, like, the impact of the war on drugs and have a conversation with them. And, and they ask about the accelerator, and they go, okay, so why are you doing this? And I go, okay, well, first off, let me tell you the story of how this whole industry came to be. You know, when you can start to show, like, people who are in a bubble that narrative, and they can kind of put the pieces together and go, I'm putting my dollars behind, you know, Ford's fund because, like, you know, this is this new emerging industry. And I'm like, dude, like, I, the only reason I get to play here is because, like, of the people who come before me, you know? And just that narrative alone that I'm seeing with investors that are, like, putting their money behind something that they just kind of just see, like, the upside in, telling that story, I just, I, it resonates, you know, like, I, I, every time I go back, like, I keep saying, like, I see the, kind of the evolution of, like, consciousness of, of some of these very, very conservative thinkers. Um, it's super rewarding, yeah. It is. I think, I think our, or for us at TWA, it's, again, it's sort of case by case. Miss Grass was a, a friend of mine's brand that, you know, it was female on cannabis, and then now I have a friend who I'm sending her business plan to you for your accelerator. Uh, and it's an African-American woman in cannabis. And two years ago, I remember she was just really pissed off. It, it's like, why the, why the F do a bunch of white men get to go make money off of this um, uh, when, when my you know, relative's still in jail? And, and I was like, do something about it. And she has. And, and that there are now, you know, I'm, you know, hitting her with a little money so she can go to an African-American women in cannabis conference. Um, and I don't think that existed two years ago, and it does now. So it's pretty cool. It is really cool. Um, uh, Wendy Borman did a film, Mary Jane's Women of Weed, looking at the, uh, I was looking at, at uh, equity and gender, and it ended up looking at pretty much everything across the, the board having to do with cannabis and who some of the players were. And at the beginning of the film, I think there was like 33% of cannabis businesses were uh, run by women. And by the time she finished production, it was down to 22. And so I think we, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that was pointed out in there is a white woman, her son gets picked up for a joint, and the cop drives him home. The, a black kid gets thrown up against the car and gets incarcerated. So we need to, there's a, all those different levels that we need to make sure that we're um, uh, rising up and, and showing our outrage and encouraging. So. You know, I look at businesses, of, I mean, I came from the tech world, and um, 
Uh, I've seen, I saw this, you know, I saw them throwing millions of dollars to kids sitting in their garage, you know, the stupid money at the beginning. And I've kind of watched the evolution and the maturity of this in this industry as it's happening. We have a long way to go, but we're, we're getting there. But our, and um, um, is there the opportunity for us to do it differently? You know, B Corps, you know, um, other sorts of, you know, models. Do we, do we take cannabis and do we just replicate the other, other industries that are out there, or do we have a chance to kind of like do a paradigm shift entirely in the way that we do business? Well, I think that... <laughs> uh, no, no, jump in at once. Th th this issue is one of the few issues that I have Republican friends and Democratic friends who agree on, that the war on drugs has to end and that mass incarceration has to change. And that's very exciting to me. And um, I think that uh, every company who is operating today, no matter what business you're in, has to have some kind of social responsibility component to what they do. It's got to be built into the DNAs of companies who are coming from the ground up, or else they're, they're going to fail. Because consumers these days are super aware, and on social media, all it takes is just one person tweeting that somebody has done something that's not cool, and people go and they research, and they go, hey, you know, there was something to back that up. It's not a company I want to be involved with. I want It's not a brand I want to support. And and especially when you think of like the Whole Foods kind of buyers who are out there who are like driving um, the way that America consumes right now, um, they're very aware. People are very aware. And um, you know, so so I, I just feel like it's it has to be part of this industry, but it it has to be part of every industry now, whether you're a car manufacturer or, or whether you're making cannabis oil in your kitchen. I I. Um in the larger wellness outside of Canada too, a lot of the companies we work with have female founders, which five years ago wouldn't have been the case. Probably the majority of companies we work with are. Um, so, so I think there is that opportunity. I think it is happening. It needs to continue. The, the pendulum needs to keep moving forward. Um, uh, African Americans, people of color, getting them out of jail is a separate issue. But I do think in terms of women, Parsley Health is... Robin Bergen, she just announced her Series B yesterday, which is mainstreaming functional medicine on a subscription model basis. And, um, you know, the trouble that she went through five years ago when she was starting that company um, and what she had to fight through and seeing her do it. But uh, so I think it's the pendulum's moving in the right way, but it still needs to, a lot, of, a lot more progress needs to be made. Yeah. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on this question for a minute because I don't think I got the answer. I didn't get the answer yet that I want. <laughs> so, and I guess since I got the mic, um, um, I'm talking like the way that we're forming companies. Like, I mean, CEOs making 300 uh, X of what their line workers or their lowest end are working. Um, because there's a lot of, you know, we see in the cannabis world, you have your, uh, we call them, um, oh God, tri uh, trimigrants. The Trimigrants. And uh, I know the city of Ukiah came up with a, uh, a bill of rights for these people because they were so mistreated. I mean, they were being treated worse than the uh, possible, you know, that we need our own Cesar Chavez for the, the Trimigrants that come in and, and have horrible living conditions and um, unhealthy living conditions. They're not even provided with gloves and masks in some cases, and they end up with respiratory issues. Um, to feed the, the big uh, companies that are, you know, having their, you know, billion-dollar valuations, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we do that differently in cannabis? How do we introduce the model of fairness and the fact that how much money is enough money where it's time to share it down the stream? Uh, there's a, I mean, that's a, such a larger issue and an amazing topic. I think that, you know, that the business roundtable is now kind of coming around saying this is out of whack. I, I always love this thing. If you go back and listen to uh, Ike Eisenhower's Republican platform, his health, his universal health care plan was way to the left of Obama. Uh, tax rates at that level, at a corporate and an individual level, I think we're at like 50 and 70 percent, way higher than they are now. Like it was when we understood that we needed to have a safety net. So there's something about the moral erosion of uh, sense of community, sense of civic duty, um, 
that's a much larger conversation. And I don't think you can address the 1% issue without addressing all those issues. Hopefully there's that ability to do it. I think you look at a lot of what's going on in tech and I think they didn't get that right, the issues you're talking about, but I would hope that that opportunity is here. I think Dr. Bronner's uh, is a great, perfect example. I think it'd be a great case study for any cannabis company looking how to start, you know, a, a properly run and managed business. It's a B Corp now. And I don't know if, if anybody knows, I don't, I don't know how long they've been a B Corp, but I think it was, it's been relatively recently that they've done this. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think um, brother, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Bronner's and now Brother David, their line they have is, I mean, they're doing really good work with the proceeds going to, um, they're supporting MAPS and doing all sorts of really, really wonderful work to help all of us um, in that giving back, you know, Newman's Own. I mean, there are some models out there, but because cannabis touches so many different parts of the industry, or so many different industries, if we just made one or two examples in each one of those of how you could do it and say, and, and, and support those brands and support those companies, um, you know, I don't mind giving a black eye to the 1%, doing it that way. You know, I have no problem at all doing it. So we only have a few minutes left, so I'm just going to ask a couple of questions that I've been asked to ask, okay? You in particular, Michael, if you don't mind. Um, uh, yeah, first, like, can I have your autograph? No, that was from somebody that wanted your autograph, and I told them they could talk to you offline. That's their problem. And, uh, but also, um, <laughs> you know, so... Um, Yoga, obviously, it's something that you're it's part of your daily practice. You do it on stage. You know, it's, it's, it's part of who you are. And I actually read about all the, the work you're doing now with uh, your health and, and diet and all that, and it's, it's really fascinating. Um, question I have is, um, uh, do you incorporate uh, cannabis into your yoga practice at home? I don't... Uh get high and get on the mat <laughs> um, but I, I do take CBD um, as to work with anti-inflammation you know and um, I I don't really smoke weed that much anymore really at all I, I actually when I started practicing yoga a lot when I get into down dog in the morning after having smoked the entire day before my head would kind of feel hurting so um, I kind of just like gradually cut back and cut back and um so it's not like part of my daily practice to get high like it was for probably 12, 15 years of my life, from 11 in the morning to 11 at night. And I think that that's an important message for people who are out there today is that there's so many ways that cannabis can benefit your life. And it's not just you sitting on the couch with, a, you know, an apple and a piece of foil going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that, that was the image for so long. And, yeah. and, I, and I don't have anything against it. There's, I, think, right. I feel like there's a time for that, just like there is for a drinking glass of wine or whatever. But... Um, it's not really a part of my daily practice, but what is a part of my daily practice is taking what I learned about myself on the mat out into the world. And that's where I feel like the, really the intersection with cannabis is today in my life is that, you know, when I f would sit around and read High Times magazine and they were in the back of the magazine, there'd be something about industrial hemp and how the first American flag was made from hemp fabric and how um, hemp was used as uh, paper uh, you source to make paper, and then the hemp industry was shut down to chop down timber. And there's so many things about about it that now we sort of take for granted that we can now change. Mm -hmm. And and so I guess where my yoga practice intersects now is in, in my activism and being able to say, hey, I want to be out there um, on my mat tuning myself every day so that I can be a better advocate for this plant that I really believe can. Um, bring a better quality to the lives, not only of people, but of our planet as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> so we only have a few minutes left, and I have a feeling there's going to be a one or two questions if anyone has. So do you guys have any last thoughts you'd like to? Nothing? We're good? Okay. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask the panel? Yes. Can you go to the microphone? Hi, how are you? <laughs> to ask if you were aware that Dr. Bronner's actually has a new certification for cannabis. It's called Sun and Earth, and it covers the environmental responsibility piece, but also social responsibility and how workers are treated and um, community engagement. So 
it's relatively new, so I just wanted to share that and let everybody know about it. It's not really a question, but yeah. it, it was really pertinent to what you were saying. Thanks. Thank you. So while we're waiting for the next person to get to the microphone, just, oh. oh. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Sally. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, going back to the wellness banner, I have a question. I have a brother-in-law who is a medical doctor, and we have an ongoing but respectful dialogue. He is anti-cannabis, 100%. I'm obviously the opposite viewpoint. And <laughs> he will share information with me, reports that he's read, videos of a woman who runs a um, emergency room in Colorado. It's all very, very negative. So on that note, what is being done between the cannabis industry reaching out to the medical community? Can you comment on what's happening there? And are they bridging that gap between education within the medical community itself? Because doctors are going to be at the front line of this. I cannot hear I'll probably take a shot. At <laughs> you're, you're the doctor. I was going to say, I, I think that I'll probably answer that one if you don't mind. So what we're doing. So sitting one, two, three, four people over to your left is Dr. Harry McElroy. Dr. Harry McElroy came to me about, he's going to stand up because he, uh, he deserves your attention. Harry's a, uh, a, an integrative health functional medicine doctor here in San Francisco. I'm just giving you an example. I can't remember if you heard me, saw me, read something or whatever years ago. Yeah, I was through dress wedding. You see, it's all you know, word of mouth from, from Harborside, co-founder of Harborside with Steve. Um, looking for information about how to do this medically and had the humility to come and say, teach me. Explain to me how you work with cannabis with your patients. And um, I was like, oh, hell yeah. I mean, I'd already taught uh, Dr. Jody Goldstrich, uh, Eloise Thiessen, who now has her own practice, and a series, a myriad of other doctors and nurses. You know, I teach at mostly medical conferences to break down the barriers and to, like, and to uh, break down a lot of the myths. But it's by one by one training these doctors and, and or these physicians and these medical professionals um, to destigmatize and take that away to then have them go out and teach their peers because they're not going to listen to somebody like me but they'll listen to somebody with a bunch of letters next to it before and after his name so that's really the way I've been doing it is like you know you know you drop the pebble and then you just watch the circles in the river expand doing on the education side, um, bully pulpit, what, ha what have you, to educate people in a way like Patagonia has been? Specifically with hemp? I think it was, a, I, I think it was unfortunately an afterthought of a lot of companies. It was like everybody rushed into the market, and then they realized, oh shit! Like, well, what is this? What is this harm reduction thing? Or you know, how like, do people even know what they're getting into? And so I think that 
uh, I'm happy to report that I have seen over the past, you know, nine or so months, a lot of companies are stepping up and they're building initiatives within their their brand and their marketing and their narrative to properly start educating. I think a few of them did it right from the early from the beginning, but it's it's a it's a growing trend right now. I think uh, it's it's um, about the way that critical mass just reaches people. You know, finally, and you know when you see athletes who are wearing um, uniforms, like in the Big Three basketball league, which is this new basketball league, and they were sponsored by CBD companies. Uh, many of the teams were. And you see athletes wearing it, when you see politicians who are out there speaking openly about it, when you see your next door neighbor, when you get invited to a party and there's people there enjoying cannabis, it starts to go. Oh, this is you know, like, gosh bunch of weed was smoking, nobody died, like, God, that wasn't in the movie I saw when I was in sixth grade, you know, <laughs> and so it starts to, it starts to change people, the way people think about it, and the way people feel about it, and then maybe they try it themselves, and they realize, wow, there's some really incredible qualities to this that, that I can take on in my life, and then the opportunity to have, to be able to access it in so many different ways today, whether it's a tea, whether it's a cream, whether it's the plant itself, whether it's it's something else. There's so many ways for people to access it now that it allows people to, um, <laughs> I hate to use the word gateway, but <laughs> um, it is a, but, a, a, but a you're, you're, gateway you're, to health. Yeah. And you're talking about like where, like, I don't think we've anywhere near that tipping point. We worked with a, a CBD beauty line called Kanuka that had a really good year, and it's Manuka honey and, and CBD. And the number of times that they've had to answer at Ulta or Macy's or Saks Fifth Avenue as it rolls out, like, will I get high from putting on this CBD? It's crazy. So the, you guys are in the Discovery Club, and... and it's a process that won't, you know, I think everybody has to take some ownership in helping educate others around it as, as we move toward that tipping point. Absolutely. I mean, every one of us is a teacher and a student at all times in our lives. And, you know, somebody asks a question or you hear, so, you hear something um, being talked about, don't mind stepping in and saying, you know, I couldn't have helped but overhear what you're saying. You know, let me set your ass straight. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, you know, bad information spreads faster than good information. So let's just make sure we all remember that we're the teachers out there. Huh? Well, I'm, I'm working on it, unfiltered and all. Thank you all. Thank you.